So I'm not a honeybee researcher. Um, I am an R&D scientist of sorts. I work at a biotechnology company. I have my bachelor's degree in molecular biology and my master's degree in molecular and environmental toxicology. But I, I don't do environmental toxicology. I actually program um, automation equipment or robots, usually liquid handlers, to set up um, DNA, RNA purification, nucleic acid analysis, and I've been supporting forensic DNA typing labs for the last 15 years, either as a technical services scientist or as an R&D scientist developing applications and installing and training customers on how to use them. So I work a lot with the state police labs, the um, forensic DNA typing labs around the U.S. and, and even across part of the world setting up workflows for them. So I'm going to do something a little different with you today. We're going to talk about a research paper out, well, this is Thomas Seeley. So he has been studying honeybees most of his adult life and has written a lot about them, has some great books, and has done a number of, <clears throat> I think, highly relevant um, research studies and published them. And so one of the studies he's done this was from 2007. Um, was on feral bee population that exists in the Arnott Forest in uh, northern New York. I think it's more in central New York, but good map. Um, so let's jump into it. Um, so this is the paper of Thomas Seeley, Honeybees in the Arnott Forest, the journal, the year it's published. And I gave you all a copy of the paper. So part of making sense out of a research paper like this is really understanding the parts of it and getting a sense for how to work your way through it. It isn't like reading a book. You don't just start at the beginning, typically. You can, but I don't. So I'm going to kind of guide you through what I do. Um, a couple times a year, I will go online and do use some search engines, literature, to do literature searches and look for papers that I'm interested in, either because I was at a meeting like this and a topic came up and I want to know, you know, what do the researchers think of this and what experimentation has been done, or because I'm just looking for foundational basic biology information that can help me make sense of a problem or ask questions about a problem that might lead to other, you know, other papers. So Joe, I yeah. just wanted to, you know, you said you just jump on the internet and do a search. Um, what do you prefer? I, I actually like to use Google Scholar. Google like, Scholar's a good one. So it's scholar.google.com, and you can just type in some keywords, like you want to know about viruses and varroa, and it'll come up with scientific journal articles. Yeah, that's, that's a great one for people who don't, don't have their own institution, yeah. in their own institution system to go through. Um, we have a library at the company I work for, which is Promega Corporation. It's a biotech company in Madison, Wisconsin. And so we have a number of search uh, systems that we subscribe to that I can access a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that I also can't access. And so I have a friend who works at University of Wisconsin. When I can't get a paper, he gets it for me. So that's, that's how I get my hands on the stuff I really want to read. So people here could maybe ask us for a paper here and there that yeah, scholars trying absolutely. to charge them money for. Yeah, a lot of times you go online and they'll, they'll want $20, $30, $40, or they want to charge you $12 just to read it for 24 hours. And, and there are ways of getting it. You know, we need to protect copyright, and we, need, we, we don't want to illegally disseminate or provide electronic access, but for me to print out a paper for a discussion today and give you all a paper copy, I don't think I'm infringing on any copyright laws. Are you making money off of it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so understanding how to go through a paper is really kind of, you know, starts with understanding what the parts of the paper are. And when I do those searches, the first thing I usually run into is the abstract. So talk a little bit about the abstract and the other parts of the paper. Uh, introduction, materials, results, discussion, references, and part of understanding how to read the paper is also understanding, you know, how each part of the paper is synthesized. There are parts of papers you can generally absolutely trust, and then there are parts of papers that you have to really evaluate for yourself. Do you agree with what the researchers concluded as a result of their findings? And that's where a lot of the gray area lies in most of the research that's done. 
So the abstract is just a brief introduction, um, kind of identifies what the study's about, what the results were, and often makes a statement as what the authors believe they you know, discovered as a result of the work. So I, I almost always read this first because most of your searches will bring you the abstract, and you can read the abstracts for almost every paper that's out there without having to buy the paper. So it gives you a preview, um, get an idea of what's in it, and then decide if I want to get a copy of it and read further or not. This is the abstract for the paper, so just to give you a sense of what goes in an abstract or how they're designed. Now, this is about feral colonies of European honeybees living in the Arnott Forest. It's a preserve in New York State, studied over a three-year period, 2002 to 2005. Um, Interestingly, this population was previously censused in 1978, so there's some history on this that makes this rather interesting and serves to provide um, fodder for additional research work in future years. So we're back in 2007 right now, keep that in mind. We get to look at this paper through the lens of 2018, so we've got 11 more years of experience and other work to reflect on that the authors didn't have. Um, Census revealed as many colonies as before, so just as many in 2002, even though Varroa destructor was introduced to North America in the intervening years. Uh, most colonies located in fall 2002 were still alive in 2005, so that's kind of a finding of the research that's plugged in here. Uh, they proved to be invested with Varroa destructor, but the mite populations did not surge to high levels in late summer to see if Arnott forest bees can suppress the reproduction rate of mites, colonies of Arnott forest bees in New World Carniolans were inoculated with mites from apiary and growth patterns were followed. Um, last sentence, no difference was found between the two colony types. Evidently, the stable bee mite relationship in the Arnott forest reflects adaptations for parasite mite er avirulence, not host bee resistance. So that's kind of the conclusion that the author came up with that we're going to evaluate ourselves. The introduction part of the paper comes next. Um, I usually skim over this because there's a lot of background information and if you read a lot of papers in a particular area it often repeats the same kind of information over and over. D, yes? This is old to me in 2007 but I wanted to let you know when you reviewed the confidential files from the Smithsonian Institute these same mites he's talking about here were all over the United States pre-1917. And that uh, is what's on vsource.com. In this book I've got that was published as nothing new except that after declassifying it, when I took it out of the Smithsonian, which they didn't like, then all of a sudden, I mean, it's a good written paper, it's just that it says it's a new parasite of European honeybees. It's not new, it's been there all along in the confidential files of the Smithsonian, over in Spain, or European countries all say the same thing. Yeah, well, and you have to think about... You have to think about research papers as, yeah. as kind of that disclaimer. These these are the views of the authors yeah, and I'm participants in the study. It's, it's a real great paper. It's just that in the first introduction here where it says it's a new parasite, you all the declassified files that were secret and confidential and top secret say otherwise. And that's what's in the book and what I've been fighting about for over 20 years. Okay, but the word's finally getting out, at least. But Sealy, this is a good thing. So, usually the introduction ends in a paragraph that really tells you what the paper's about. So often I'll skim through it, find that last paragraph. And so this is, yeah, the paper reports a three-year study of a feral population of honeybee colonies living in the Arnott Forest, the research preserve, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the current study had four goals. And so we're gonna look at the data associated with these four goals and discuss. Uh, to determine whether feral colonies remain abundant in the forest, to determine if colonies in the population are infested with Varroa, to determine if colonies in this population are long-lived despite infestation, and if they are long-lived, 
to determine how they have achieved a stable host parasite relationship. That's a lot um, to do in one paper. And one nice thing that, that was that uh, Sealy did in his paper, he's kind of laid it out with these kind of these titles in each section. So he kind of broke it up in a way that makes it easy to read and easy to sort through. Um, I usually spend a lot of time looking at the results though next. The results of the paper are the findings, but this is where the data is presented. <clears throat> the methods tells us how they generated the data, but if you really want to dig into a paper, I usually look at the results first and then I look at the methods. So we're going to talk about the results and then we're going to walk through um, kind of step by step what those results mean and I'm going to ask you guys if you agree with them at various stages in the process. Um, usually if the results don't tell me what I want to know I stop reading and move on to another paper so you know if you're doing your own lit searches you can do that. Yeah? That's what you want to know not what you want to conclude right? Just to clarify. Well you know I look at all these papers and I say I, I, I don't say this research is right or this research is wrong. I, I look at the research as, as an experiment. And you know, if you're searching for an answer, you're probably not going to get that answer unless you're asking the right question. And research works by asking a question and deducing the answer. So if you already think you know where you're going, but you're asking the wrong questions, you probably won't end up where you want to go, if that makes any sense. But that's kind of how research works. You come up with a hypothesis. And you know, in this case, the hypothesis is, you know, there appear to be wild bees living in the forest. Are, you know, are, those, are those bees surviving Varroa? Are they infested with Varroa? You know, the hypothesis is maybe that they are, they are not. And you, you evaluate the bees and you decide whether it's true or not based on the data you collect. So, um, it, it really just to sum it up, if you don't ask the right questions, you're probably not going to get the answers you're searching for. And so it's kind of a weird way of looking at the world, but I look at the answers first and then I look at the questions and say, did they really answer the question they strove to answer? Um, and a lot of times, depending on how the study is actually set up, it may or may not convince you. Um, I try not to look at it all with bias. I try to understand all of the well-written, well-designed experiments for the results they have. Because, you know, saying these researchers are right and these researchers are wrong doesn't do any of us any good. It just leads to more of that entrenchment and more of that arguing. But to understand why these results and these results actually support the reality of the world we live in. There's only really one reality and a bunch of unanswered questions. And all of the data is meaningful towards that common understanding. There just aren't enough people looking at the work in that way. So this is, um, this is from the paper. This is the research area that they looked at. And this actually shows um, the lines from bait stations that they put out to identify the location of feral colonies in the forest. And they would put these bait stations out in the cleared areas, so the lighter areas. Um, and the bait stations are numbered, and then they have lines radiate them. So they, the bait stations would be some kind of a flavored sugar solution. It's called bee lining. Is everybody familiar with bee lining? Mm -hmm. The bees would find it or you would trap bees and get them drinking it and then they would come and go and come and go and you would try and get a line on them. And so what Seeley did was would get lines on the direction the bees were flying from each of these bait stations and then he would periodically trap a bunch of the bees, walk in that direction for a while, release the bees, let the bees reestablish the line and then continue until he found the location of the colony. A lot of people um, read Seeley's books on how to do this and actually go out and do it and find feral colonies. A lot of them find managed colonies too, so it, it works both ways. You <laughs> find a little bit of everything. Um, but Seeley found, I forget how many 
uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, eight or nine. <coughs> eight. So, eight, yeah, you found eight um, bees and trees in this particular region. Um, and this, this is a, I think a half, you guys can probably see it better, half mile. So we're talking about really something that's maybe two and a half miles wide by four or five miles long, and there's quite a few colonies in that area. Eight square miles, thank you. Yeah, you guys have the paper. If you're kind of skimming through it and you want to throw stuff out, that's helpful to me because I haven't memorized everything in it and I certainly can't present it all. Um, this is the, um, just a satellite view of what that area looks like. If you contrast this with where I live in south central Wisconsin, ours is almost all lighter colored stuff, which means no forest. Um, honeybees love to nest in trees in my area and in the north. It really provides them with ideal habitat. If you don't have trees, they go into buildings. There's a lot of habitat in this region of the country, and so <clears throat> not a huge surprise that it could support a fairly robust feral population. I think there are many parts of the United States where agriculture is king, that you're not going to have that same kind of opportunity for feral bees to, to thrive. Um, which means if you're trying to catch swarms, it can be very difficult. <coughs> um, this is the data from the part of the study where he proves or tries to prove that the are not forest colonies are infested with the road uh, destructor. And I wanted to highlight the result. And he, he's got three colonies here in the study, and we'll talk about where he got those colonies. Um, interestingly, he says monthly assays of mite population in feral colonies living in hives in the Arnott Forest. So what he did was he actually trapped swarms, and I'll show you an image of that in a moment. And then he used a mite drop, 48 hour mite drop in the bottom of the box. So he wasn't messing with them too much. Just go in, stick a sticky board in, pull it out and count on a monthly basis. And so yeah, he found mites. Um, he found a mite population that oscillates between higher numbers in August, September, October, and then lower numbers in early May, June, and July, um, peaking again towards the end of the fall. So definitely it looks like there are mites in the hives. And I don't know if any of you do mite counts. A lot of treatment-free beekeepers don't, unless they're just curious. Um, anybody familiar enough with mite counting and mite counts to say whether these are terribly ugly numbers. If you had 48 hour mite drop in a colony, would you be concerned? No. Yeah. no. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm often looking for research or looking for information on what a kind of a normal mite drop would be. Remember, almost all of the literature on mite drop and mite infestation is based on uh, a system in which the mites fairly rapidly kill the bees. Okay? Almost all the research has been done on bees that are not tolerant of varroa and die within two or three years. Uh, but we do have, and this, this paper is from Rinder et al. Um, this is data on Russian honeybees. So the Russian honeybees were brought here from, from the Primorsky region of Russia and have been studied. And what we see in Italian domestic bees is that um, in the first year quite often the mite populations remain low but it's in that second year where the population will really boom and the data stops because the colonies all died but in contrast the russian bees are tolerating a very fairly high total population of mites um, up to four or five thousand mites per colony in these in this particular study which then drops off in the fall. And I think that's really the interesting thing is that instead of it just continuing to skyrocket, that there seem to be in resistant bees is mechanisms that kick in that can reduce that population on the bees um, over time and prevent colony death. And so I think that's what we're all trying to capture with our treatment-free methods is we want bees that control the mites. We don't want the mites to, to um, reproduce uncontrollably and so we have even from the research literature data that supports the conclusion that mites 
can and, and are controlled in some colonies. Um, persistence is another question altogether. So, uh, how long do you think you have to maintain bees treatment free to be confident your stock is mite tolerant or mite resistant? The number that I've seen a few times has been three years and Seeley actually uses kind of a three year fate. The study is carried over three years. So he looks at the fate of feral colonies in the trees. They inspect the trees at least three times a year, um, May 15th, June, around the 1st of May, 15th of June, and the 1st of October. So they found eight colonies by bee lining in October of 2002. Uh, in May 2003, they reassessed and found six of those colonies alive. So it's two colonies had died over winter. Uh, in June, there were still six colonies. In October, there were two, two sit, there were still six colonies. And then in May 2004, it was down to five. They had another colony died due to a tree toppling over. And so that, that nest site is now eliminated from the population. Um, the uh, bees, can, those, those trees remained occupied for the rest of the study through October 2005. And there was one additional empty tree that was repopulated by bees and found to be populated in October of 2005. So you have here at least, um, at least five colonies that are continuously alive throughout this three year period um, in the forest. And three years is kind of a good mark. If you can keep a colony alive without treatments for three years, I think you've got pretty good bees. Would everybody agree with that? Yeah. 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 Most people are just trying to keep them alive year yeah. to year. Yeah. <laughs> Where the paper really gets kind of interesting and weird is um, in this statement. And, and this is, you know, it's interesting that he does this in his results part of the paper because he titles the Eats Root section of the results with a conclusion statement, which isn't typical, but it does help break up the paper if you're looking for a specific piece. And so uh, he says that the R0 forest bees are not inhibiting grow destructor population growth. And I think my next slide really, well, when we get into the materials and methods, this will make more sense. So what are the results that lead him to this conclusion? What he does is a monthly assay of mite population in paired studies, one, or paired colonies. One set of the pair has a queen from the forest, so a feral queen. The other half of the study set has a, a commercial queen, a carnial and commercial queen. And so these colonies are monitored over a summer, um, July, August, September, October, um, mite counts are made, and you can see that the population of mites increases, in some cases really high, um, but in the paired colonies that are each put in individual places <clears throat> quite a ways away from the forest and well away from each other, you can see a similar pattern of mite populations over time in the colonies. So that's the result. To make sense of the result though, you really need to have a little bit more information about how the study was set up. Um, statistically, you know, you get a statistician to run the numbers and they say uh, the results are all the same, right? So there was no difference in mite numbers, statistically, between colonies headed by feral queens and colonies headed by carnival queens. It comes, comes, comes back to that, uh, question. Are, are you asking the right question? And is mite resistance purely a function of controlling mites? And if, <clears throat> and if this is what the mite counts look like in your feral colonies that you capture from the trees, and then you put queens into colonies for your study, and this is what the numbers look like in the study, to me it doesn't look a heck of a lot different. Yes. Did he differentiate between feral bees that are naturally sized or escaped domestic that are still overly large trying to get back? That makes a big difference. Not in this study. Yeah. This is a great question. 
Um, he did in a more recent study, which I have the abstract for, um, an electronic copy of paper. Yeah. In your Italian versus uh, Russian uh, graph there, yeah. it looks to me like there is a point at which the varroa will overwhelm them, which is up there in that higher area. Yeah. But if they can keep it down in the lower area, they can control well and, and that those that's the difference in the study the the bees that are overwhelmed are the Italian stock bees the bees that are not overwhelmed are the Russian bees and they're they're maintained otherwise on exactly the same equipment the only difference in that particular comparison was the origin of the bees so the the genetic stock and, and you know other factors um, and you know that's kind of the basis for threshold based treatments is that we know that the bees can tolerate low levels of mites we know as the number of mites increase the risk the colony is going to be lost is going to increase and we know if it gets to a certain level it probably doesn't matter what you do they're going to die and that's largely based on Italian type of colonies I mean that study's been done hundreds of times that's the control study you know the untreated half of the study and every every research um, project that's ever been done to look at whether a mite treatment helps or not is you leave some of the colonies untreated and then you treat them and they've only stopped doing that in the last five or ten years because it's, a lot of people think it's unethical and they've done it so many times it's automatic you know it's going to happen with these bees under those conditions so then you kind of switch from studying bees that you know are going to die to we treat these bees with treatment A and we have new treatment X and we compare treatment A to, to treatment X and you often drop the untreated control from the study altogether so if you're reading papers on the efficacy of new treatment A, B, or C you'll often see it compared to um, the, you know, the, the author's favorite current treatment that's used to control mites why, why aren't they doing strain versus strain? You know, the, the small ferals versus the big academies. Uh, there's, there's a lot of good questions there. Believe Wait. That's an interesting did, did he actually determine the ferro bees were Russian bees in his study? Or no. They, so this is, this is an aside, right? This isn't related to the study. This is some data I pulled in to kind of give you context. Because, you know, a lot of times I look at data and I say, well, is this normal? I see mites in my colonies, and if I check my colonies in late September, sometimes I'll see, you know, 6 or 8% mite infestation. And, and then my bees still live. Um, so I gave this to you kind of as a reference point, that, that this, is what, this is what mite numbers look like in colonies that die from mites in the second season and this is what colonies that are known to have some resistance look like in that second season um, there aren't as many studies on resistant bees as there are non-resistant bees and it's the nature of the subject you know you have your model system and you have this commercial beekeeping industry that everybody wants to provide a magic bullet for because there's money in providing that bullet and so you work with you work with what everybody else is working with in order to try and give them an answer that they want and will pay money for. D. Question. Yeah. You're talking about uh, comparing to the treatments uh, that they've been using, which I imagine is over time versus new ones to see if there, there's a difference, you know? Yeah. But then as bees or mites acclimatize to the treatments, so they become lesser and lesser for doing anything, you bring on a new one that they've never seen, you have a completely different relationship going on for technically looking at the one they developed resistance, the other is a new one that they haven't seen that should be doing better anyway. So you publish something saying, look, we find something that's better and yet they don't call the other one any good because it's, it's, it's been used for so long and uh, nature adapted. Yes, and, and that, you know, that has been the problem with most of the treatments that have come out, is that mites have become resistant to them over time, uh, that the mite population has developed or evolved resistance, and it can happen at a very short time. 
Um, and it's likely that every treatment that's ever produced will select four mites that are less susceptible to it. And we have yet to find any treatment that kills 100% of the mites all the time. And you can't prevent your colonies from getting mites from the neighboring colony again anyways. Okay, so, question. yeah. Since mites have been on the planet for millions of years and they're identified by point of infestation, which means that you've got to find them out of need to call them what you're calling them. Technically, if there are other animals moving in their hairs where the mites are, they transfer to the bees so they can have a new point of infestation where they can be carried other places. Uh, why aren't the mites on the other livestock called the same names? and everything put out since there's, they say there's several thousand types of mice, but yet it's all the same family and they're all similar. I don't know, and it's not subject to this paper. Maybe maybe I should pick a paper related to that next time. <laughs> yeah, no, question. That's certainly uh, a tip off to the market from a particular bee or another animal. But ultimately, the taxonomy is based on genitalia, on fine structure of the animal of, of that mite. Mm -hmm. um, so you just bear down on it. You know, well, and, and you know, bees and mites, you know, if, you know, if you're talking about any parasite, we can generalize it, but just to talk about bees and mites together, you know, they've, they've been together and evolved together in a, in a certain kind of way over hundreds of millions of years, right? And so each of the mites that is found on the bees have a specific biology, right? Um, tracheal mites live in the trachea, varroa mites do their thing. And, you know, what, what you find is mites are very, very specific to a certain part of the body, a certain way of infesting, a certain way of reproducing. So while they're all mites, you know, like all insects are all insects and all birds are all birds, they all have their own little niche. They all do their own little thing. And, I don't, I don't generally lump them all together because it's, to me it's more interesting the, the biology of the specific mite and the specific role that it has. Um, although when you throw a miticide in the hive, it probably kills all of them. So of the 30 plus mites that have been identified and are known on honeybees, you're not just killing varroa or tracheal mites when you throw a miticide in the hive, you're killing all the other ones too. And some of those could have had beneficial properties that we don't understand, or never knew about, and now they don't exist. So you're killing off part of the colony. Um, it affects the biology of the colony, not just the mite. You always have off-target um, subjects when you throw chemicals in the hive and you just don't know how you're going to tip the balance of that ecology. So there's a lot we could talk about there, but I'd like to get back to the paper. Um, so to understand more about the results, we're going to have to dig into the materials and methods. Materials and methods are really the, the basic exact design of how each experiment was set up or each part of the research problem was answered. Um, these, these sections of these papers are meant to be concise, but they're supposed to be detailed enough that another researcher could actually reproduce the study. Um, materials and methods obviously go hand in hand in results. I frequently refer back to them for more information when I have questions about the results themselves. And you guys have asked some good questions already about the results. So it's good to understand better what was done. Um, so we talked a little bit already about establishing feral colonies. So Seeley actually put up swarm traps. Anybody know anything about swarm traps? Yeah, you might. So this is a box that he put up. He just, he, he did a lot of research on this and he's written books on the subject. And so he wants to get feral bees. He knows they're in the trees. He wants to get some to do some work with. He puts out swarm traps. Easily enough done. Um, 
he doesn't tell us a lot of details, if you look at the materials and methods, on exactly the hive. He tells us that it's a single deep hive. He tells us he, the size of the entrance. He tells us that it's fitted with a screened bottom board so that he can do 48 hour mic drops. Um, he tells us that he stocked it with, I think, eight combs of worker comb and two drone combs to match kind of the normal balance in the hive. He doesn't tell us what the size of those cells are. It's, it's actually really, really common for researchers in, you know, of honeybees to tell us that they managed colonies by standard methods. Well, if I asked you what, a, what standard methods were, each and every one of you would give me a different answer. Um, and, if, and if we just focused on foundation, and, and somebody told you they put foundation in their hive, um, you're probably all buying it from a different place, and it's all different size, and plastic versus wax, and versus how, do you, how do you reproduce the work of, some, of another researcher without those details? But where do you draw the line in terms of putting so many details in a paper that it, you know, that it's unreadable too? Um, it, it's a challenge. You know, anytime you're working with biological organisms, even just capturing feral colonies, um, there's a lot of questions. Biology is not an easy area of research to, to do work in and to come up with solid conclusions. And you know, I give I give the people who do this work a lot of credit. Seely spent hundreds of hours in the forest finding these colonies so that he could do this work. Um, so he's going in those colonies and checking them, he should be able to get a little comb sample to know what size they're on, too. Yeah, and not everything that he's done is published either, you know? Scientists pick and choose what they publish. And well, I'll tell you what, I, I, work, I work in a research laboratory. I develop products. I do a lot of experiments. It doesn't all go in my notebook. Um, number one, I can get twice as much work done in a week if I pick and choose what goes in the notebook. So I put verification validation results in a notebook. I put findings that, that end up going into patents into my notebook. I, you know, and Sealy isn't going to, and there isn't a place to publish all of the work that he's done or any researcher has done. So there's, there's unpublished results probably stacked 50 times higher than the actual published results, which problematic, but it's just the reality of the world we live in. We are fortunate that Tom Seeley is still alive. Yes. And kicking. And so I've sent him emails with specific questions regarding this paper and his more recent one. Mm -hmm. And he gets back to me and he answers those questions. Yeah. So yes, it would have taken just one more little sentence right there where he yeah. identified it to cover the bases in terms of cell science. And how yeah. was drawn now, Seeley is not unaware of cell size. Seeley did a small cell study that was published a number of years, I think, before this. So what happens is when you nudge him and he responds, he'll also respond in this next paper. You can almost be sure that he'll clarify comb size if, if he's monitoring populations. Yeah, and that's, and that's good when, when that happens. But, it's not just comb size. There's always other little details, and and sometimes sometimes the details are important, and sometimes they're not, and sometimes they're left out, and and another scientist can reproduce the work, and sometimes they try to reproduce the work, and they can't because of some detail that was missed, and it's just the world we live in. It's not a criticism. It's just with you know with these kind of biological or systems and organisms, it can be really challenging. So. One comment about the map uh, of where his colonies, where he located his colonies. Yeah. He, on this occasion, he surveyed, um, in his estimation, about half of the forest. Yes. Um, and in previous surveys, each time it came out to about half, and each time about eight colonies identified. Mm -hmm. It seems like he just stops at eight. Um, so that's a minor, but it's not so minor a criticism when to the left, to the west in that map, is a state forest, uh, what's he call it? Cliffside State Forest? Yep, Cliffside. And, and there's another one to the north. And it is a cliff. 
and it's likely to have a lot of mature trees. Um, and may contain a surprising number of bee. Yeah, you can see he's actually got some bee lines here going yeah. off in that direction. So, um, probably but, something this way. But let me add one more thing. Yes. It's a little misleading when he's showing the uh, uh, bee lines from those feeding stations. In this regard, is that he has a little box and he very cautious, cautiously monitors the incoming bees. He only allows a few bees in and bees out. He's not really opening it up to, in that particular meadow, how many different hives are foraging within, or colonies are foraging within that meadow. So eight is an interesting number, but in that later paper that you just mentioned, where he looks at the genetics, he uses some formulas and comes up with an estimate of 200 colonies participating in that population right there, in, in the Arnott Forest population. So it's very, it's this boy, I wish somebody had taken him to task on that, clarify, he really did need to expand that concept of 200 colonies in the Arnott Forest. Well, and, and even when there's eight colonies in the study, and you take, you capture three swarms, and you have no knowledge of whether those three swarms actually came from the forest or not. And then from one of those colonies, which just happens, the other two were destroyed by black bears, and the other one was kept in order to raise queens from it for the next part of the study, and it was on the verge of swarming, and so he ended up producing the test colonies, six test colonies from the swarm cells of that colony. So we, we don't really know whether that swarm actually came out of one of the trees in the forest, or any of the trees in the forest, but it was the, it was the root material for the, you know, basic, the biggest conclusions of the paper. All of the mite counts were yeah. from those swarms. We don't know if they really came from the trees or not. And the study on mite counts with the, um, the, the forest queen versus the commercial queen was done with a single one of them. Six queens raised from them, mated in the forest. But there's a lot of questions we don't know the answer to and, and may never know, except that we do have some genetic tools now. If you were to have saved the bees as genetic samples, frozen, uh, Wouldn't from be surprising. Those three, from the three swarms, and he could go back to those, given yeah. the genetic analyses he did later, where he was able to show that yeah. indeed his forest bees in trees uh, were distinct from the commercial beekeepers' hives nearby in two adjacent, uh, not adjacent, Absolutely. But two bee yards. So, so he could add more to that in the paper. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about the actual study he did. We've already kind of jumped to some of the same questions and conclusions that, that I've had. But So six pairs of matched colonies, comb brood bees, mites from stock colonies. So these are managed colonies from uh, the, the, the local, um, or not the local, from, from the, the, I think it's Liddell Station, which is associated with the university. Um, anyways. He raised these queens out of these captured swarms, got them mated in the forest, and then took them all out of the forest to compare them against queens, colonies headed by queens from a commercial source. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of the details from the paper here. So, yeah, so he moved colonies outside the forest for the, for the proper study. Um, 50 kilometers, I don't know why 50 kilometers is relevant, but it's definitely outside of the study area. He located them at least five kilometers from each other, but he had, um, he had both of the paired colonies in the same location and placed them at least 10 meters apart to minimize drifting. Does anybody believe that 10 meters apart is far enough to minimize drift? No. How do you define minimize? That's a great question, yeah. Um, drift, drift is certainly a challenge, and there are quite a few um, research papers that have looked at drift, and, and we know that bees will move from colony to colony, especially drones, but quite often even workers will. Um, and we know that mites hitchhike rides on 
bees and will move from colony to colony. And some of the stuff that I've been reading with Russians lately, um, you know, they don't recommend keeping Russians with other bees primarily because the other bees are going to have higher mite numbers and you're going to get drift of those mites into your Russian colonies, which could be problematic for them. But um, you know, drift is a challenge. And I think you talked about drift yesterday. It's a significant part of your study design is how do you minimize drift? It's probably going to be the biggest criticism I've ever Yeah. You did a good job planning for it. Painting the colonies different colors, orienting them different directions. Most drift I see is when they're all the same color or there's large yards and their own pallets and it's always on the corner of the yard. So it's, it's easy to see how drift can contribute to, you know, mite, kind of mite equalization. If you're counting mites, and mites are able to travel from one colony to another at any rate, then you know that the numbers you get at the end of the study are likely to be, for the colonies that would otherwise have really, really low mites, the numbers are likely to be significantly higher. For the colonies that have really, really high levels of mites, the numbers are likely to be just a little bit lower. And so the, the, the question is, does it matter? Well, it can certainly affect the outcome of a study in which your measurement is mite numbers. Okay? Can I add there? Yes. Drift has been shown and published on over in Europe and the Nordic states to co-mingle with highs up to a mile and a half apart where they equalize out with the mites with the stronger ones giving the mites to the ones that don't have it especially the smaller size ones, so that each cell uh, equalizes out in a good mile and a half to two mile rate, uh, radius very easily. And I don't see hardly any of that done in this country to talk about. There's, there's a fair amount of research on it. A lot of the problem is that research is, is like old, you know, and sometimes things are topical and interesting and a whole bunch of researchers do a bunch of work on them and publish on them and it was 30 years ago and, and then you learn new things and you, you know, have new, you know, ideas and new hypotheses and you just take for granted all of that previous work but then sometimes people forget about it. It's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of prior knowledge that could be valuable, but it all depends on context. So we know drift is a problem. We, and you know, we've probably been overexposed to drift as a potential problem because everybody who's keeping um, commercial bees, right, standard bees, package bees, is afraid of drift because they're afraid mites are going to come into their colony and kill their colony. Well, I used to worry about it, but I don't worry about it so much anymore because. I don't really see mites as a problem, drifting in moderate levels at least, into colonies that are perfectly capable of dealing with them. So drift is a problem for me if my bees are susceptible to what's drifting. If my bees aren't susceptible and it's not an excessive amount of influx, I'm probably going to be okay. Um, you know, another thing you see in a lot of the papers, and certainly was done in this paper, was looking at the colonies at the end of the study to determine the number of frames covered by bees and number of frames filled with brood. And, and that's just a general thing that's done so that if you have weird results in your mite numbers, you check the colony and make sure it's still alive. Because if they're not raising any brood, it's going to significantly change the dynamics of your mite counts, especially in a mite drop assay. Um, if you're doing that kind of an assay. Yeah, Dee? I just wanted to let you know where we started a little bit later. Yep. Uh, Jacob Moose needs to talk. He was supposed to start at 9, so it'll be 9.30. Let me so see what I can do to wrap things up then. Yeah, you've got about 15 more minutes. All right, thanks. Um, so this is that data. We've talked about this already, the potential for drift influencing the results. Um, we know that the mites in these colonies came from brood and bees from stock colonies. Okay, so it's not even actually the mites that were in the bees in the forest or in the swarm from the bees in the forest. So while we tend to be very focused on, on the bees and the presence of the mites, 
We rarely consider differences in biology between mites. I mean, really, not only do we have a feral population of bees in the r not forest, we have a feral population of mites and bees in the r not forest. And I don't think enough people are thinking about the research in that regard. Um, certainly, I have seen evidence in some of the Russian literature suggests that the biology of those mites and their reproductive cycles are different than the mites um, in an Italian colony. And is it because of differences in the mites or the biology of the bee, or is it because of the very intricate relationship that the mites and the bees have? Somebody will figure it out someday, but you know, keep that in mind. It, you're not necessarily dealing with the same beast in, in your hives versus what's coming from packages from out of town. And certainly, if, you know, if you're only thinking about the mites and not the viruses that they transmit, you're missing a, another huge part of the puzzle. So the discussion, discussion is really kind of the fun part of the paper where you get to hear what the author thinks of their results. Um, and there's a lot we could talk about here as well. Um, they elaborate on the findings, they give us their personal interpretation. Sometimes I agree, sometimes I don't agree. That's fine, it's, it's, you know, you don't have to agree with everything. In fact, you shouldn't. You should digest it and decide whether you think the evidence is sufficient to back up the author's claims. It's what, um, I think that's why these things get published. They're not published as facts, they're published as research papers. And I think too often when we read about a researcher's work in the newspaper or in some other secondary literature source, we often are confronted with the author's conclusions in that literature piece and not given the opportunity to really evaluate the results ourselves. And so, you know, if there's a take-home message for you guys, it's when you, when you read about something that somebody did, don't be afraid to go look up the paper. And if you can't get a hold of it, you know, call me or call somebody or, or reach out to somebody or go to your library. You can get a lot of these things through the library too. This, this paper is not that hard to read. Uh, you don't have to have a degree in molecular biology to read this paper. When you get into some of the genetic analysis, it, it gets a little more challenging, I admit, even for me, and I've got, I work in that area. Um, but, you know, for you guys, it's like, you're all able to read a paper like this and digest it and compare what you think based on all the other things that you've learned at all the other conferences you've been to um, and decide for yourself what you think is really valuable and move forward with that. And what you think is questionable, look for more answers. Um, virulence theory and horizontal vertical transmission, this might be the last thing we get to really talk about. Um, Tom Seeley really likes his virulence theory. And in a lot of the stuff he presents, he talks a lot about horizontal and vertical transmission. So um, to understand what that is and to think about it, you know, horizontal transmission is really what everybody fears. It's, it's mites moving from one colony to another, infesting that colony, potentially killing that colony, and then moving on to other colonies. And um, Contrast that to vertical where um, the mites are in this colony and the only way the mites reproduce, in other words, get to inhabit another colony, is if that colony is strong enough to reproduce and swarms and moves into another tree. And now there's a family of mites here and a related family of mites there. And that's the difference between you know, vertical, which is transmission from colony to colony because it reproduces. So it might be, if you're thinking about you know, deer and an intestinal parasite. If the deer survives to have a baby and the baby picks up that intestinal parasite and survives, then the parasite has reproduced and thrived, right? But if the deer dies before it can reproduce, then it can't reproduce. So there's a relationship between the host and the um, parasite that if the parasite is too toxic to the host, it kills the host. It, puts its own life in peril. And we usually talk about Varroa from a horizontal transfer um, perspective. In other words, 
that it's really not a transmission from, you know, from a colony swarming to the new colony, but it's a transmission of mites across colonies, across the landscape, it's important. Um, and virulence, you know, sometimes you have to look words up. Don't be afraid to use a dictionary to look up words. What is virulence? Well, virulence is the severity or harmfulness of a disease or a poison. It's, virulence is the tendency of something to kill you, right? So the virulence of mites is the, the ability of the mite to kill the colony. So, you know, kind of the question that I always get stuck with when I hear this and I hear all of the rhetoric after somebody concludes that, you know, it's horizontal or it's vertical or they're virulent or not virulent is, you know, well, do viral mites really fit with virulence theory? And, you know, when we think about this particular research study, I almost think some people were surprised that Seeley found wild colonies surviving in the forest, right? And there's, there's more evidence to support that these are actually wild colonies, not just escape swarms. And it's been done dozens of times and published, well, it's been, do, it's pu been published dozens of times and feral colonies surviving, it's not anything new to this group. But um, I'm trying to remember the question I was gonna get. You know, this virulence theory idea, almost, so if, if, it's, if it's not surprising anymore that there are bees living wild, is it surprising that there are mites in every one of those colonies? Well, I don't think that it should be surprising because from the time mites were first found, right? We're gonna use that with quotes. Um, to the time those mites were essentially believed to be everywhere in the United States. I, I don't think there's a colony in the United States or anywhere in the Americas that doesn't have mites. So somehow mites transferred horizontally to each and every colony across the landscape, no matter how far apart they were. So I don't think we really need to talk about um, vertical versus horizontal. I think all this theory is kind of blown up because every colony that is out there is going to have mites by the simple fact that those mites are able to travel. And might will travel. I mean, it's it's how they got across the entire landscape. We shouldn't be surprised that they all have mites, and we shouldn't be surprised that we can pick up mites from other colonies. So, horizontal transfer isn't just a theory; it's just the reality that we have to deal with, and we have to know that we're going to get mites from other colonies into our colonies. So, I disagree that every hive across the nation has mites. Well, I can't prove it. Uh, well, That's. <laughs> When we took out the bees, there were no mites. Now, it could be the trauma that they'd gone through previous to, to us taking it, and, and we have yet to find mites in our hives. You have an idea on that? Let's clarify and say that they're all exposed to mites. They are all exposed to mites. That was exactly what I was going to say. You can have a colony that's 100% free of mites today, but I will guarantee you some point in the future that colony will be exposed to mites from another colony. I'll agree to that. Okay. They've been exposed. And that's a very important distinction. Yeah. You may, you, you might treat them and kill 100% of them. Don't treat them. Or you might, you might have such a low number you just never see them. How are you that's looking? That's more likely. How are you looking? With your eyeballs? Yes, we are. And <laughs> we are inspected every year by the state inspector, and he killed drone comb looking, <coughs> looking for mites in my drone comb. And he couldn't find it. That's the drone comb. That's the drone comb. That's the drone comb. I got a question on the mites and transfer of mites. Wouldn't they also fall off like at popular watering spots where bees, many bees water? Some fall off of one bee. Interestingly, bee since we're talking off. about Sealy, Sealy's actually done studies to show that mites will drop off on flowers. Okay. I'm and and when that. the next honeybee comes along, they'll jump on that honeybee. So that's been that's been done. They're very nimble in that regard. They got sticky fingers. So you know we can't count on a colony being free of mites forever, which is part of the reason the whole treatment regime doesn't work. Even if you could kill 100% of the mites in your colonies, you cannot prevent your colony from getting reinfested. And infestation with mites is ubiquitous, right? It can be lower in some colonies and higher in others, but. It is a part of the landscape of beekeeping now and it can't be changed. 
And, and when you say, even if you're talking about hypothetical, you know, as far as we know, again, you, know, you can't kill all mice. We know we'll kill 100%. Yeah. We, and, we've been, and we've been doing it for 30 years. Maybe I should restate that. There's no guarantee in the way they'll kill all the mice that doesn't kill all these. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> just looking quick because we're running out of time, which I, I wasn't surprised. I was worried about having enough material to keep you busy if you didn't ask me questions. But, um, you know, role of managed colonies is something that I have a lot of interest in. And with mite bomb theorists and with discussions of how, how your bees are going to infest my bees and how my bees might infest your bees, uh, it's an important thing for us to, to kind of keep in mind. And so I asked the question, does the presence of managed treated colonies in an area prevent the evolution in feral populations? When we think of evolution, we think of the, you know, the development of resistance in the population. And we've, we've seen feral bees in areas that are remote. Right? Well, I ask, why, why do we study f bees in remote areas? Well, it's because it gives us a higher confidence level that the bees exist there as a result of the, their ability to survive, not as a result of just being swarmed out of commercial apiaries. Um, but really the question at hand is, can all of us, despite having managed colonies that are treated around us, manage bees treatment free and be successful and i know solomon talked spoke of it yesterday and a lot of other people are in areas where people are managing bees with treatments and i think the answer is yes are there challenges probably but yeah it can be done um and depending on where you're at it can maybe be really challenging because i don't feel i have a good strong feral population in wisconsin based on the last 30 colonies i've caught right and 28 of them died from apparent mite infestation and viral, you know, mite-related viruses. Um, so, I, you know, I have challenges. I don't have an R-naught force to get bees or I would be way ahead of where I am now. But I can, you know, I do have a couple good colonies and I need to split them and see if I can maintain that resistance over time in order to prove that Yes, it can be done, even though 95% of the colonies around me are managed bees. Yes? Going with this general flow, and it really keeps coming back to the two papers cited and many other papers like this regarding heroes. Um, at the bottom of that first page, Evil and Bull's two papers, that's where he's grappling with the idea of, oh, over time, He's thinking hyperdispersed colonies are pretty much on their own, and even though there's long distance transmission, it's at a lower rate than when colonies are stacked side by side. So, in that instance, and thinking of this classical literature on epidemiology, the notion is the closer you're packed, the higher the rates of physical transmission, that's the condition for higher virulence because it's okay to kill your host because you'll be able to jump easily on into the other, um, the next host. And so cholera is one of these classic ones where everybody comes mm -hmm. in the same drinking hole. So I'll say one thing. No, 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 let me get to a point. And that is that if I were a beekeeper up in New York, I might very well want to go into Arnott Forest or similar forest like that with a large residential population of hyper-dispersed colonies and collect varroa and inoculate my colonies with these, running with the assumption that they are probably less virulent than if I run over to a commercial colony or an array of colonies and collect varroa from there. That's sort of an interesting, weird outcome of thinking like Thank you. Yeah, well, let me remind you, Seeley didn't actually do any study on mite virulence. No, he didn't. He, he has added mite virulence and horizontal and vertical transfer to a discussion that is absolutely irrelevant to the actual data at hand. Um, something to keep in mind. Again, in the discussion and introduction parts of the paper, you often get biases and information, you know, about what the researcher thinks the results mean and what other research they might do. Song? 
I've had a question came up for a while. Um, genetics has shown that at a certain point, the population of cheetahs got down to as few as four individuals. And the effects of that are a severe narrowing of the gene pool, such that all cheetahs are so closely genetically related that they can have organ tissue grafts without needing uh, anti-rejection medicine. They're all functionally identical genetically mm -hmm. and very close to being literally identical genetically. If, assuming that the conventional theory is that mites were introduced into the country, they would have been introduced in very limited numbers. Yep. One, two, maybe. So, the data supports that. How much variation that. between virulence in a population with that limited gene pool can there be? That's a big question. I'll answer it with one thing. There's a lot more to the overall biology of an organism than just its DNA sequence. Okay, we need to finish now so we can push the thing off. I'm going to wrap it up with one, one other point. And that we can talk more about that later. Because it's, it's an important topic, and it's important to understanding things. But you know, when you're reading a paper like this, and you're going through the materials and methods, you know, Seeley started with bees in a tree. They swarmed. He put them in a box. So we've had one change of context. A year later, new queens were raised by that colony. Put them in another box. But now he just took the queen. So he took the queen out of the context of the tree, he took the queen out of the context of the hive that it was in with the bees and the mites that it had been with. And then he drew an equal sign between the bees with the queen in the box and the bees in the tree. And that's always a big red flag to me. It's, to, it's, it's obviously not equal, but we often, in science, we look for model systems to draw conclusions from which to say something about the system that we're, you're really difficult, it's really difficult to study bees and trees, right? That's, that's a fair, it's a, it's a fair argument, but when we think about the results and what the implications of the results really are, we have to keep these in mind, which is why kind of going through the details of the methods and understanding how the research is done is just as important to interpreting the results as anything. So I'll quit with that, and uh, we can talk more over lunch. <laughs>